In today's video, we're going to talk about four of the false teachings in the Watchtower Society, why it's dangerous to Jehovah's Witnesses, and why it's dangerous to someone who is currently studying with Jehovah's Witnesses. And we're going to get to it right now. Okay, so my first point actually has to deal with um, their stance on government, their stance on voting, and their stance on pledging allegiance to their country of origin. Um, so when I was growing up, we weren't allowed to pledge allegiance to the flag, which doesn't seem like a big deal, you know, standing up in class and not putting your hand on your heart, not saying the pledge, it's not a super big deal, but it goes further than that. I'm going to point us back to the past and then I'm gonna point us to a present experience that one of my family members is going through right now because of this false teaching. So in the past, um, when the country was going through the draft and they were drafting these young men who were you know, between 18 and 25, whatever, um, at the time, the teaching in the Watchtower Society was that you could not join the military uh, because that was sinful against Jehovah. So um, what the military would then offer you is if you're not going to serve in combat, then you can take what they call elective or selective services, which meant that you were going to be paving roads, building hospitals, you know, whatever it is that the, the government needs you to do that didn't include combat work, right? Um, yet the Watchtower Society still taught that it would be um, it would be shameful to Jehovah if you went ahead and did those things. So now you're left with two options. You can either get drafted, go into the military, more than likely perish in battle, or, oh, and here's the consequences when you come back. If you accept that and you survive and you come back home, now the society, the congregation is going to disfellowship you and you no longer have any friends and family that communicate with, communicates with you when you come back home from combat. Okay, so there's option number one for a Jehovah's Witness at that time. Um, later on, you know, some of these brothers decided that they weren't going to go into combat services. They didn't take selective services, so where did they go? They went to prison for four years. Now they have a felony charge on their, on their record for life, and they've been to prison for four years when they're 19, now going on 23, and they've spent the first, you know, four years of their adult life in prison. And a lot of times the U.S. government would come back in increments of four years and say, hey, do you want to serve now? And some of those brothers would say no, and they'd spend another four years in prison. So now you have eight years in prison and another felony charge heaped onto your record. So you can imagine that that's going to have some consequences for getting jobs in the future or your education or even navigating life, start, starting off so late in life, trying to, to build your income. Um, and then just for a, a few years to pass after that, and for the governing body, those eight men in New York at the time, uh, to turn around and say, okay, you know what, selective services is okay. So what about those brothers who spend 8 to 12 years in prison, or even 4 years in prison, and their life is dramatically altered for the rest of their life here on this planet? Yeah, that's a pretty dangerous teaching. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us into the present. I have a family member who works on jet engines uh, for big planes. So he had a job at Boeing, and because he started studying with Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they were convincing him to change jobs because Boeing makes war or death machines for the United States military. Like, are you kidding me? That, that'd be like if I worked at Home Depot and somebody came in and bought an S-Wing hammer and used it to kill someone else. Well, now I can't work at Home Depot because the hammer that was sold to that person that took that other person's life is associated with Home Depot. None of this makes sense, and it's not godly, and it's not biblical, and I'm not going to get heavy and deep into that, but I'm just, it's, it's a load of crap and it's very dangerous and it does have real consequences. So with that being said, let's go ahead and move into point number two. Okay. Number two, dangerous teaching in the Watchtower Society. And I firstly just want to apologize. I should have warned you in the beginning of the video that some of this stuff is uncomfortable to talk about. Some of it is heavy. And the reason it's heavy is because we have a heart and we have empathy towards people who have experienced um, the repercussions of these false teachings. So that's why it's, it's slightly uncomfortable. So I understand if, if it's not the funnest thing to listen to, uh, but it's the reality. So if you're, if you're a Christian watching this, um, just understand what these people are going through. If you're an atheist watching this, just understand that this is the mind control that these people are, are being subjected to. 
I mean, I, I think that we can all have empathy in our hearts. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness or if you're on the fence, Jehovah's Witness, understand that these are things that the society has taught and waffled and flip-flopped on forever, you know, or, or for as long as they've, they've been in business. Um, okay, so we're going to get into the second point. That's the disfellowshipping uh, protocol. So that wasn't always a thing in Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, what's funny is you can go back in time through their publications. The Watchtower has a beautiful paper trail of all of their publications. A lot of this stuff can be found online, um, and it's not apostate material. It hasn't been doctored. But basically, um, at one point in time, they never taught disfellowshipping in the, con in the form that it takes today. Uh, was never observed by the early Jehovah's Witnesses, right? In fact, they would they would consistently point towards uh, Catholics and say, look, look at how evil they are for excommunicating their members. What an evil practice. And they'd have whole articles talking about why it's not biblical. And, and then lo and behold, as the years progressed, they're thinking, oh, that's actually a pretty good tactic. We should try employing that ourselves. So disfellowshipping is when uh, someone commits... Uh, a gross offense or you know you've heard it on my other videos if you watched my other videos but basically a, a gross sin uh, it could be like adultery unrepentant alcoholism or, or you know there's a list anyways we're not going to get into that but basically if someone uh, gets disfellowshipped that means your friends and your family members cannot communicate with you it's actually worse than being dead because when you're dead people remember you fondly um, when you're disfellowshipped you're alive and you're walking around as if you don't exist and the things that that does to a person, the, the damage, the mental um, damage that happens to a person when they're walking around in that state is incredible. And there's a reason why there's, there's statistics floating out there right now that your average Jehovah's Witness is four to ten times more likely to commit suicide than an average person. Okay, four to ten times more likely. Now, the reason that this is such a hard statistic to peg down is because most of the time when they're filling out a, a death report or a coroner's report, they don't have to put the person's religious affiliation down. So that's why it's very difficult to actually peg this number. But do I believe that to be true with all of the Jehovah's Witnesses I knew that had alcohol problems, deep depression, feeling like you're never good enough, feeling like at any moment, you know, Armageddon could come and the world could you know, could end in this fiery blaze of whatever, and then you just don't know if you're good enough. I mean, think about those things. It's running rampant in Jehovah's Witnesses, and no one wants to sit back and acknowledge it because they teach that we're supposed to be the happiest people in the world, and it's it's absolutely false. So is disfellowshipping a dangerous practice that the Witnesses use? It's absolutely dangerous. It's life-threatening. So again, happy point number two uh, let's go ahead and move on to their third doctrine, which is very dangerous. Okay, third doctrine, uh, blood transfusions. This one is an easy target for some of us. It's it's easy for us to understand that, you know, um, let, let's just take it from a bi biblical standpoint. You know, when Jesus healed that man on the Sabbath and the Pharisees, aka the Watchtower in this instance, um, they looked at him and they said, how dare you perform work on the Sabbath? So he healed a man. So Jesus turns to them and he says, you know, who of you, if one of your sheep fell down into a hole, would not stoop down and reach down and pick up that sheep out of the hole? If you would do that for a sheep as a human, how much more valuable is human life? So if I heal a man on the Sabbath, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm actually preserving life. Um, there's a concept out there. I can't remember the name right now. I'll go ahead and insert it into the video of what that principle is of, of preservation of life over um, observing the law. Like there was literally a teaching for that. And Jesus demonstrated that when he healed a man on the Sabbath. Okay. So even if you're, again, an atheist or, or um, you know, a Christian or studying Jehovah's Witness, um, Jesus basically gave us the example. The preservation of life comes before observing the law, right? So if you want to try and, and take this weird arbitrary text um, from the Old Testament and, and form a whole doctrine around that and try and inform people of what parts of their blood they can accept and what parts of blood they can't accept, and if you do a blood transfusion outright, then it's a disfellowshipping offense. 
And if they want to try and say it's not a disfellowshipping offense, they're full of it. They're going to find a way to disfellowship you if they figure out that you've had a blood transfusion. But it goes further than this, guys. It goes, it goes legally, and then it goes to mortality. So what I mean by legally is everyone who's Jehovah's Witness right now, if they're doing the right thing according to their teachings, they have what's called a blood card. Uh, well, at least it was a blood card when I was in, but, but I would have to fill out this blood card, put it in my wallet, keep it with me at all times. So if I got into an accident and I wasn't able to tell someone about my religious conviction against blood transfusions, uh, which I do not have, but when I was a witness, I would have, um, then if they were operating on me and someone was rifling through my personal things and they found that card, then they would basically have to say, we can't give them a transfusion. And I, you know, if that was the only thing that could save my, my life, I would die on the table. All right, but you know, some, some doctors, if they're good people, they would ignore that card and just say they didn't see it and they would save my life because they would be doing the right thing. Um, so the, the other thing I wanna point out is I don't just have that card, but what, where that card goes is to the congregation. They have what they call a HLC, a uh, Hospital Liaison Committee. Okay, so it's a, a specific dedicated group of brothers who are well-versed in um, the law when it, when it concerns religious convictions you know, where, where the United States government can step in, where they can't, what your doctor can and can't do. Um, and these HLCs, if they figure out that you're in the hospital and you're unable to make your own decisions, they'll like swoop in. They'll be really nice and polite and all this other stuff to the, uh, to, you know, whichever doctor is working with you, but they are very, they're lording over you. I mean, they don't let, they don't let family members or friends who are non-believers anywhere near you. Uh, because they don't want you to be swayed towards taking a blood transfusion. So they would rather you die than, than be able to speak to your friends and family who are non-believers. And, and when I say they would rather you die, that's the truth. That's really how they feel. And it's, it's also very dangerous too. What I mean by legally is, you know, not only do I have these guys coming in, but let's say my wife was a non-believer and um, I, I was or whatever. And I had these these HLCs, these hospital liaison committee members, you know, in my room. She would no longer have the power of attorney. I signed that away when I signed that blood card and I gave them a copy. That's scary stuff when your significant other is not your power of attorney, but it's a group of men who does not know you. That's terrifying stuff. And the fact that people are legally doing this stuff and it's being taught in their places of worship, that this is the right thing to do, that this is a loving arrangement, according to Jehovah. And then when you go to these, sorry, I'm keeping it on guys, but this is what it is. I'm trying to move quick. Um, they actually celebrate people who have died because of this false teaching. I remember sitting at conventions and they would have like pictures on the screen of, of small children who had passed away because they were being faithful to Jehovah. No, their, their parents let them die. And, and the doctors knew that they could save them with this life-saving treatment. But the parents thought that they were doing the right thing. And the children thought that they were doing the right thing because the Watchtower, this book publishing company, it's not even a religion. It's not. It is a business. It's a worldwide, global, organization, business, book-selling company. Uh, religion sounds a lot easier to say, I, I know. But that's, that's what the Watchtower is. So... You have people dying, at least three witnesses a, Three witnesses today will pass away because of this false teaching. And I think that statistic may even be undercutting it. I'm gonna go ahead and research it. If it's false, I'll cut this part out. I'll insert the, the actual fact. But that's, that's terrifying stuff. Guys, people don't need to be losing their lives over false doctrine, especially in this day and age. It's, it's wrong, and again, it's dangerous. So let's move on to point number four. Okay. So this is uh, the fourth point of the video, and honestly, there could be more points, but I think that these are, these are four of the heavies, okay? And this is where I'm going to lose uh, most of my atheist friends, so I'm sorry, guys, but um, the Watchtower is very good at convincing people that once you die, you die, especially if you're, if you're not accepted into paradise, then, then you're just soul sleeping. You're just asleep forever. No consequences to any of your actions. Death was the consequence, right? So the thing that separates um, Hitler from you, if you don't accept Jehovah, is nothing. You both sleep. You both deserve the same, right? Well, um, I don't think Jesus taught that. And again, this is where I'm gonna lose a lot of my atheist friends, but I'm just, 
I want to I want to bring up the the story because because there's a lot of people who agree it's it's not a parable. It's Jesus didn't tell this story in the same way that he would talk about the parables. Um, and there's people who can who can emphasize that point much better than I can. But basically, there was a a rich man and and a, a beggar named Lazarus. And this rich man lived in the lap of luxury. And there was a beggar at his gates named Lazarus, and he was covered in sores. And it was, he was so humiliated because dogs would come up, and dogs weren't really a great thing. If you every every time you hear about the term dogs in the Bible, it's it's a derogatory term. So it was a very humiliating experience that dogs would come up and actually lick his sores. And the reason he was hanging out at this gate is because he just wanted the the table scraps from Laz or, or from the rich man's table. Well, basically, what ends up happening is Lazarus passes away, and he's carried. He's carried to Abraham's side by the angels. And then you have the rich man who ends up in Hades. And he's looking up and he can see Abraham and he can see Lazarus. This, this beggar is next to his side and he's being comforted. And he basically cries out to, to his father and he says, you know, can you just send Lazarus to dip his finger in, in water? Like just get a little drop on it. And, and then to take that drop and put it on my tongue, I'm in agony burning in this fire. So it doesn't seem like he's soul sleeping to me. It seems like he's very aware of the fact that he's in torment right now. He's in agony. You know, and you read further into the story again, guys, this is Luke chapter 16, and it's going to be verse 19 through 31, okay? There's eternal consequences to our choice to either accept the sacrifice of Jesus and repent of our sins and then realize that he rose on the third day he defeated death we confess with our mouth that he is Lord okay or we say you know what I reject all of that and both these things are active actions neither one is passive I either accept that sacrifice on my behalf and what it means for me or I reject it I'm not just sitting here like I don't know and anyone who says they don't know, they are lying to themselves. So the reason that Watchtower, this is one of the most dangerous things. The other three things I listed are temporal. It's going to happen here on this planet in this lifetime, right? The fourth and most important one is that their souls are literally on the line of being in eternal communion with God or being in eternal separation from God. So... You tell me which is worse, these three over here, which are pretty bad, or this last one over here, which is huge. It means start here, draw an arrow, and never let it stop going that way. And that's what eternity is, never ending. Okay, it might, it might have a starting point, but it never ends. So if you're a Christian watching this and you're, you're wondering how important is it that I reach out to these witnesses in my life and I, and I try and help them, it's eternally important. And if you're uh, someone who's studying with Jehovah's Witnesses, I would say, get out of her, my people. <laughs> like, run for the hills, get in your Bible, study it for yourself. Don't read the Watchtower or any of this other propaganda on the side. You know, I, I would go a different direction, but start with God's word. And, and, and let, let him teach you who he is, not men teach you who he is, okay? And then again, if you're if you're an atheist and you're still here, I applaud you because you know some of this stuff was kind of biblical. But um, I just want you to to continue to have compassion for these people, you know, instead of calling them all stupid because they're in this cult or whatever. You know, it, you may have been there at one point, so have sympathy and empathy for them, but but don't don't look at them as easy targets because honestly, they're they're people too, and they're just being misled. So. Anyways, guys, those are the, the four teachings that I believe make Watchtower dangerous. It's, it's not just like, you know, oh, it's another sect of Christianity or anything like that. It's a dangerous teaching. So uh, lastly, I want to point out, if, if you guys are enjoying the videos, if you want to support my ministry, if you want to help me continue to put information out about uh, Watchtower and help people out of that, that system, then uh, you could always support my channel by... Of course, liking, commenting, but also you can purchase a shirt for yourself. I'm going to put a link in the description. My wife and I designed this shirt. It's the Lion of Judah. On the back, it's got victory. I'll go ahead and insert a, uh, a video in here talking about it. But three things are going to happen if you purchase this t-shirt. Firstly, you're going to get a cool piece of apparel that's hand-designed by me and my wife. 
Secondly, you're going to support my ministry and the videos here on the channel. Thirdly, and this is one of the coolest aspects of it, you are going to be contributing towards uh, fighting human trafficking because Chelsea and I are taking a portion of all of the proceeds from these shirts and we are directly uh, donating it to Oper Operation Underground Railroad, which is a organization that is designed to actively seek out human traffickers and go in and save these kids from these terrible situations. So again, if you would like to pick up a shirt for yourself, I'm gonna leave a link in the description below and maybe even the comment section. And uh, if you guys do get a, um, if you do get a shirt, try and find a way to, to get a snapshot to me. Uh, maybe I'll list my Instagram in there or something. But anyways, I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you on the next video.